You're listening to the Author Stories Podcast. Bringing you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Margaret Wine, Terry Brooks, Sheena Kamal, Matthew Quick, JT Ellison, Walt D. Williams, Brad Ford, Corey, Dr. O, Brandon Sanders, Robin Mock, Ernest Klein, Jim Butcher, Sherwin Harris. Visit hankgarner.com for archives of all the shows. Today's guest is. Well, thanks for joining me again for the Author Stories Podcast, where I bring you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Today, I'm really excited to have Simone St. James on the show with me today. She has an amazing new book that is perfect for this time of year. It's called The Sundown Motel. And uh, I'll tell you what, this is a must have for your uh, for your reading shelf or your uh, to be read pile beside the bed uh, as we go into fall and things are getting a little creepy. This is a perfect read for this time of year. Welcome to the show, Simone. Hi, thanks for having me. I'm excited to have you. Um, Simone, we begin each show with the same question. And that question is, what is your first memory of wanting to be a writer or storyteller? Um, well, that is a good question. Um, uh, I would say that it was probably when I re- first read uh, The Hobbit in grade four. And I read it. And I wanted to be the person who wrote The Hobbit. (laughs) (laughs) It was like, I love The Hobbit. And I read it. I had a copy that was, it was an ugly, smelly old copy that had got at a used book sale. And I read it until it fell apart. But it wasn't so much that I enjoyed the book, but I also had the desire to be the person who wrote The Hobbit. And um, I got a little notebook and I wrote my own version of The Hobbit, which amazingly was almost exactly like The Hobbit. But it had a, I think she was, oh, it was a, it was a girl and she was riding a horse because I was in grade four. So, of course, uh, of course. So, but it was a hobbit. So instead of Bilbo Baggins, it was a girl on a horse. It was pretty good. I, I enjoyed it. Um, so that was kind of my first uh, real feeling of that itch to be telling a story instead of just reading one. And um, I've always written ever since then, I've always written. And uh, until my mid 20s or late 20s or so, I just always assumed. I was just writing for myself. The Hobbit story was just me writing for myself for my own enjoyment. And that's always what it was. And it never really occurred to me uh, until my mid to late twenties that um, I could actually try to publish something that had just never crossed my mind. And once it did, I I really kind of started aiming for it and it took a long time, but um, it was worth doing for sure. That's amazing. Um, Simone, I've met lots of different writers that, that write in all sorts of genres. And one thing that is a that seems to be a touchstone with so many writers is uh, their early love of fantasy and Tolkien or C.S. Lewis, especially. Um, what do you think it is about these fantasy stories that intrigue so many of us in 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 so similar a way? Uh, why do you think we all kind of go back to the central point uh, it, it, in the beginning? Yeah, I think. When you're still a young kid and you're a young reader, um, you're still like kids have such an imagination and their imagination is still very real to them. And so I think those books kind of reflect the idea that, um, you know, you're just going into a whole other world and having adventures and um, it has nothing to do with the world that you're in. Um, I think that's part of it. Um, Yeah, it's it's. And I also think that for a lot of us who are, um, you know, um, pre we, who were we were young readers pre Harry Potter, yeah. you know, those books were the only book readers. Um, you know, the Narnia books were some of the only books. Once you got out of, you know, children's books, and you became a, a you know like around grade four, you became that sort of young reader. There were no Hunger Games, Harry Potter's YA uh, genre for us to that Tolkien was actually one of the only books that a young reader could really access. And of course, once you got into his, some of his other works, it was not quite as simple as the Hobbit, but the Hobbit was one of the only books for a 12 year old, really. True. And, and then after the Hobbit, you kind of fall into the deep end of the pool, don't you? Yeah. And then you get to the end (laughs) of the Lord of the Rings and then you're like, Oh, now what? And then he had a bunch of other like 
esoteric sort of really in depth into the mythology of the world. And it was like, okay, well, <laughs> I guess I'll try it. <laughs> Simone, what, what, uh, what got you fascinated with, um, with horror stories or, uh, maybe horror is not even the right word, but these, uh, psychological suspense, uh, and kind of the, the darker side of storytelling. Well, one of the authors that I read way, way, way too young is Stephen King. Uh, as as a lot of us did. A lot of us did. And I had a brother who's four years older than me. So that means when he was 16 and he was reading Stephen King, I was stealing everything off of his bookshelf and I was way too young. But, you know, I think I really think that um, we're seeing now like Stephen King molded a lot of storytellers who are now, you know, mature storytellers. and. Um, so definitely his books I read uh, way too early and I loved them, everything I could get my hands on. Um, I'm not sure what the appeal is with Stephen King to young readers. It's, it's actually something you see a lot, um, people who are 12, 13, 14, reading those books. I think maybe it's also because the prose is very accessible, um, very readable. Uh, it just hooks you right in and you just keep going. And I don't know what it is about it, but... Um, that was one of the main influences I had early on that um, I, I learned to enjoy the dark side of things for sure. One of the things that I love about Stephen King's work, and and I think this is one thing that, that makes it so accessible to, to such a wide audience, is that his characters are so um, generic. And, and I mean that in the best way possible. Yeah. Like they're, they're people that you could meet uh, on a trip into town in any any day of the week. They're just yeah. regular people. And, and, uh, you know, I, I kind of get that feeling with the sundown motel as well. Like these, these are characters that could just, just show up on the stage of, of my life any mm -hmm. particular day. Um, is there anything, um, specific that you think about characters that makes a character more accessible or, uh, maybe less believable? Do, do you ever weigh out um, you know, character choices. I do. Um, you do want to make your character accessible to the reader so that they're going to root for them because one of the keys to writing any kind of suspense or horror, if you want to go all the way to horror, but is that the reader has to be worried about what's going to happen to this person. They have to care about this person to the point where they're like, oh my God, what's going to happen? And then once they're invested, you got them hooked into your suspense. That's a big part of it. So um, you do have to kind of think about that. Um, and so one of the, some of the things I use for building characters, I like to use humor. It's a little subtle, but some of my characters, you know, they got a little bit of a they got a little bit of a snarky sense of humor. Uh, and um, they, their internal monologue sometimes has got a bit of a snarky sense of humor to it. They're people who are, you know, not just this humorless sort of shells and um other than that i mean you know fleshing them out giving them pasts and inner lives and fears and hopes all those things if you can round all that into the character um you've you've creating someone that you know readers are really going to root for and hope that they get through the story alive <laughs> instead of hoping that they instead of hoping that they die <laughs> That's funny. Um, Simone, you said that it didn't dawn on you until uh, kind of later on in your journey that that books would be something that you could create. Um, did do I understand right that you uh, worked for quite a while behind the scenes in television? Yes, I did. But I did not work in dramatic television. I worked in live television. I worked mostly in live sports. Um, I was not in front of the camera in any way. I was um, in one of the cubicles in the back offices doing literally doing spreadsheets as part of my job um because <laughs> someone has to figure out how much money we're spending on these sports shows and that was me but um so i did spend a lot of time in, uh in the tv world and um i loved it it was a fun fun it's a fun world to be in for sure um but uh it was definitely not dramatic television. I did never came across script writers or any of that kind of thing. 
So there, was there ever a time where you kind of made the connection? You know, I'm I'm working in this creative world. Um, how come I'm not creating? Was there ever a moment like that, or or was this just you know it's it's just another industry to work in? Uh, no, I'd always been passionate about television, uh, but I'd always also been a passionate reader, and so it just took a little while for that to click. I mean, like I say, I'd always written for myself, so I always was creating. Um, but it was the idea that it was some that it would be good enough to submit. That's a big hurdle yeah. to get over when you're when you're a beginning writer, when you've when you're usually just telling yourself stories, um, stories that you think are interesting. And and it it's a big it's a big change in mindset to think somebody else might find this story interesting or maybe a lot of people could find the story interesting. Like it's, it's a big mental leap you have to make. and. Um, I didn't make it until I, uh, what I happened is I joined my first writer's group, uh, in my mid to late twenties. And, um, and they, these writers would sit around and they were writer's group is learning craft and critiquing each other, but it's also talking about how to get published. And it was like, really, I could like, you know, I could make that leap to like sending this out into the world. It's a terrifying, terrifying leap to make, to take your writing and at, at the in that at that time was literally put it in the mail and mail it out into the world <laughs> it was uh it was a hard it's a hard leap for any of us to make so um it took me a little while to make it but once i made it i i just kept at it what was that first story that you wrote simone that that you knew um you know could have a life uh out in the world uh, was it the first thing that you wrote did that get published or um, you know, were there some desk drawer novels along the way? Oh, there were definitely desk drawer novels. <laughs> uh, my first, the first ones, the first ones I, I wrote and sent out were actually romance novels. Um, because I had the idea, I was like, which a lot of people have, which is, well, this has got to be easy, easy to write, easy to get published. And of course, anytime you start writing any type of full length novel and you get partway through and you're like, there is no way this is easy. What was I thinking? But um, right. so I, I I thought I would be a romance novelist. And uh, I wrote a couple of romances. I submitted them to agents. They were rejected 100%. Um, I was rejected for six years before I uh, wrote The Haunting of Maddie Claire, which is my first published book, which, again, was when I was like, well, I think this is interesting. I, I, I don't know if anyone else would ever want to read this or whatever. <laughs> And uh, that was the book when I mailed that one out. Um, I got an agent who wanted to represent me and she sold the book within like, I think, eight or nine months. We'd had it sold and um, I've been on contract ever since. Wow. Um, w without beating a dead horse, um, when when you talk about writing romance, because uh, it, it seemed to be an industry to, to crack into. Um, mm -hmm. What what sorts of things do you now, if looking back on that, can you recognize in your writing then that you did wrong? Like, wh what were some of the false assumptions, um, you know, without giving story specifics and all that? But what are some of the things that you assumed that now, you know, you know, I totally got that wrong? Uh, well, my romance novels were not exciting enough. I mean, they uh. just didn't have enough happening. It was just some characters sitting around and talking and and um a lot of navel actually, gazing what, yeah and yeah not much action and the the tricky the actual tricky part of actually writing a romance novel is that it isn't necessarily an action packed book the action is internal and you have to be they ha it takes skill to make that interesting to the reader um and the best romance writers can pull that off. They just suck you right into a story. And it's not necessarily someone gets murdered or there's ghosts or there's any or there's spies or there's anything else happening. It's just these two people and the, a good romance writer can just suck you right into that. But um, I just didn't have the skill to do that. So it's very flat. Um, that was one of the main problems with my first books was they are extremely flat. And of course, I'd, I, I'd fussed over them, over fussed over them. So I'd kind of. Uh, edited out anything that was even a little, you know, a little bit different or interesting or that I thought would be, you know, too much, you know, and, and so I, I'd kind of did them anything interesting out of them and they were really flat and boring, honestly. <laughs> and uh, they, they, they were technically, 
you know, they were technically correct. The, the sentences were correct. <laughs> they were, you know, the, the, the action followed a sequence. Uh, that was about all you could say for it. And so, yeah, those are definitely desk drawer books. So the mechanics were all correct and, and all there. Yeah. There was just no yeah. heart to it. Yeah, exactly. And you gotcha. just had nothing that you cared about. And when I wrote The Haunting of Maddie Claire, I had the idea and it just came to me. And I actually, I put off writing it for a while because I, I, at that point I was focused on trying to get published and I had it in my head that that, the, the my concept for The Haunting of Maddie Claire was no one would want to publish it, even though I was interested in the story. And my concept was that there's a young woman who works for a temp agency and the temp agency assigns her to assist a ghost hunter. That was my original idea. And so I thought, oh, that would be cool. What would happen if you were assigned as the assistant to a ghost hunter? What would happen? And I thought, well, nobody would ever want to publish that. And so but it was kind of, uh, it had, it was a storyline that was a little unusual. It, had, it was a little different. And once I pursued that storyline, I had something that was different enough that an agent was very interested in it. That's awesome. Um, when when writing the haunting of, of Maddie Claire, did did you feel um, in the writing of this book that that something was different that you had found the plot as it were? Um, or did did you know along the way? Okay, this one is different. I knew it was different for me because I really, really, really wanted to know the end of the story. Like I say, I had started writing it with this cool idea in my head. And I said, okay, I'm going to play with this idea. And I wrote the first few chapters and I really didn't actually know the end of the story at that point. And I, I realized that I wanted, I wanted to know the end of the story. I wanted to know what happened to these people. I wanted to know where they ended up. And so that was very different for me. Like I was, I was hooked. And so that's one of the things, the secrets to being a writer um, is that are you hooked on your own story? Um, cause if you're hooked, there's a chance somebody else will be hooked. And if you're not hooked, then what can you put in your story that, that hooks you, you know, what interests you? Oh, well, oh, well, maybe this, this character doesn't interest you, but now you give them a secret past where they're not who they say they are. Oh, now I'm interested, you know? And so you have to be thinking, it's a weird thing, but you, you have to be thinking about, are you pulled in? Are, do you want to know what happens? Do you want to follow these people around? Um, and once you get that, there's a good chance that other readers are going to have the same reaction. Are you still um, that sort of writer, Simone, where you don't know the ending when you begin or have you morphed into uh, more of a plotter, uh, you know, as you because you've got a number of novels out. Uh, how has your your writing changed uh, over your career? Well, I, I do more pl a lot more plotting now because I wrote my first book, you know, without a publishing contract. And when you are under a publishing contract, you know, your editor wants to know a little bit about where you're going <laughs> before yeah. you spend a year on this project to turn in something. And she's like, what? I did not know what this was going to be. So you have to give, there are other people who are interested in how the story turns out, at least vaguely. It doesn't have to be a scene by scene synopsis, but I want to know where you're going with this. And so I do actually now when I start a book, I know my setup, I know my setting, I know my characters, and I know kind of overall where the story ends up. But all the stuff in the middle is all stuff I discover as I go, all the twists and turns and how it gets to where it's going. And um sometimes I can even change, you know, what I'd originally planned if I come up with something better for sure. But um, yeah, I do know the arch, all that, where it ends up, uh, but I, I don't know everything for sure. The Novel Factory Online is software for the serious writer. With features like notes that are automatically organized, that means no more drowning in piles of paper, notes, or spending hours organizing digital folder structures. The Novel Factory offers clear, obvious structures for noting down information about plot, characters, locations, and everything else relating to your novel. Innovative features like the Roadmap take you from concept to finished novel. The Roadmap is an optional step-by-step -step guide to writing a novel that takes you from the premise to final manuscript and beyond. It draws on tried-and-true, tested theory 
that lies behind the majority of best-selling novels and blockbuster movies. Access your writing anywhere. The web version of the Novel Factory can be accessed anywhere you have internet. So you can write your novel on the train to work, while walking the dog, or climbing a mountain. Just log in and all your drafts and notes will be at your fingertips. Go to novel-writer.com to see how this powerful software can unleash your creative side. Use code HANK2020 for 20% off. That's the Novel Factory. Authors, I have a fantastic new service to tell you about. It's called PubSite. PubSite is a service to help you build your very own website, your home on the web, where you can promote your work and give your fans a place to connect with you. PubSite is a website platform that allows every author, regardless of budget, to have a great-looking professional website. Developed by the book marketing professionals at FSB Associates, PubSite is the new easy-to-use DIY website builder developed specifically for books and authors. Whether you're an author of one book or 20, or a small publisher, PubSite allows you to build, design, and most importantly, update your website pain-free. No need to be dependent on a designer or webmaster to make a small but costly change to your website. Save the money and do it yourself. PubSite is the best platform for authors because it's a book-centric platform. PubSite was built just for authors and small publishers. Every design, feature, and layout is book-centric. They have customized designs for you to use. It's easy to build. No coding or HTML is necessary to create a stunning, professional-looking website with all the features you want. Get a custom domain name, yourname.com. It's simple to update. You can add all of your books, add a blog and a book tour, sell from any retailer, manage your email list and social media, and even do e-commerce. Build your website with a 14-day free trial, then pay just $19.99 per month, which includes hosting. And we offer packages starting at $499 to set up the website for you. Pub-Site.com, the place to help authors find their home on the web. In in writing in the vein uh, of m- more of the things that you like to read, um, as opposed to writing what you thought might sell, um, did that help, um, uh, you know, you getting to the goal? Um, you know, is there ever a point where, you know, I, I have to stop thinking commercially and think about what what I as a reader would like to read. Um, you know, like, how do you balance those two aspects of the writing career? Yeah, that is a very tricky balance. Um, because once you've been published once, of course, your goal is to stay published. Right. So um, you want to keep writing things that readers are going to buy and Really, I mean, no one really knows what readers are going to buy. I mean, nobody knows. <laughs> so yeah. you're just trying what you think is interesting and hoping that your publisher likes it. And 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 um, once you've been published once, by the way, uh, your publisher will still turn down your ideas and you'll give them ideas and they'll just say, yeah, that's we don't like that at all. And so you have to come up, <laughs> go back to the drawing board and come up with something else. It still happens. And um, so you're always balancing that, especially, like I say, once you've been published and you're trying to stay published, because you also want to stay interested and passionate and excited about your own work. You don't want to be, like I say, back to the point where you're like, I don't care about any of these people. I just got to get this done. I mean, you want to be hooked. So um, it's tricky. And usually what it takes is several, sometimes it takes several ideas that you throw out and before you get the right one. And then once you get the right one, sometimes it takes st- several starts where you throw out first chapters or you throw out different parts of it um, before you get it right. It, it's just sort of a, a trial and error thing for sure. It is a very difficult balance. Simone, I am fascinated with um, the beginnings of things. Um, and, you know, almost all stories begin uh, with the the kernel of an idea, and then that morphs and evolves and grows, and then becomes you know the books that we love. Um, but your new book, The Sundown Motel, do you remember what that first kernel of an idea that then grew into this book? Do you remember where it began? Um, I'm trying to think. You know, The Sundown Motel um, really, really, really is the book that I want to read. Like it's my ideal book. 
um i wanted to i uh i am a like i say i have re- read stephen king my whole life um i love psycho i love the shining and i also am a huge true crime addict and i was just like why isn't there a book that has the supernatural stuff and sort of true crime in the book i would read that book and it was like well i guess if I want to read that book, I'm going to have to write it myself. (laughs) So it was kind of me coming up with my ideal mix um, between the supernatural and then adding in the true crime concept to it. Um, Because that's really what I wanted to read. Um, As far as the plot goes, I've always been fascinated by roadside motels. I've always, I mean, they're just the most, you drive past it and you think, what has happened in that? place i mean it's a fascinating and they're sort of they're sort of dying out a little bit so you see a lot of older ones and there's a lot of them are run down and um they're really i don't know they're place places that you have a lot of you can really imagine a lot of different things happening so once i had that concept like what if a roadside motel was haunted which i didn't think anyone had done before at least that i'm aware of um then i just kind of went to the races with that and added in you know, the true crime aspect and all the other things. The the roadside motel uh, motif, uh, I, I don't understand why all horror novels aren't set in roadside motels. They're, <laughs> they're kind of one of the scariest things you could possibly they imagine. Are. And, and we all just completely trust it. And we check in and we lay down yeah. and go to sleep like, you, you know, and and yeah, if you ever allow yourself to start thinking these things like this is. This is the perfect setting for a novel like yeah. this. Um, th- where did the characters come from? Because you do this really great dual timeline uh, in the book. Uh, so when did the characters kind of walk on the stage and and uh, walk me through a little bit how how the setup for for the plot came together? Well, like, like I said, uh, you know, I've worked in television for a long time, ever since my early 20s. And one of my first jobs in television in my early 20s was on the overnight shift. And it was for a TV station, you know, TV's broad, TV stations broadcast 24-7. So somebody has to be in the TV station making sure everything goes to air in the middle of the night. And that was like, I was the, you know, the student just coming out of college. So that was the beginner job. And so I had the night shift and I was in my I was a young woman in my early 20s living in the city working a night shift. And I was single at the time. So it was that was a weird, very weird experience for me. I worked at night for um, well over a year. And um, so I, w- when I thought about how scary a roadside motel is, I mean, it's even scarier in the middle of the night. And I thought, well, what if this person is working a night shift at this motel? Like, what would they see? So I kind of based both of them because both of my both timelines are 20 year old women. I based them a little bit. You know, I I. I dug into my own, you know, what I was like as as a 20 year old working those, working that shift. Um, so I dug into that and, um, but I made, I made, it's set in modern times. The modern day timeline is set in modern times. So she's, you know, Carly is a young woman of modern, modern times. And, um, and, and, uh, yeah, I just wanted her to be, you know, uh, uh, she's a very, uh, she's actually a positive person and she's a really good character and she's kind of a very you know she's got a lot of positive she's she's determined she's she's going to right wrongs she's going to find figure this out she's going to do it she doesn't see why this wouldn't work out you know she's got a lot of optimism and then i balanced her out with her aunt back in 1983 who is a darker character um she's on a darker journey she's making darker decisions um she's kind of going down into the darkness um, instead of moving up into the light. And so I just was taking those two characters and juxtaposing them. Uh, How, um, as a writer, how difficult was it balancing these two timelines? And, um, you know, did, did one timeline inform the other uh, as the writing went, or did you have a plan for, okay, this is going to be the current timeline and this is what happened, you know, in 1983 and and then go back and forth. Um, did I guess what I'm asking is did did the the story of the past did it start informing the story of the the present day? Yes, and I wrote 
I wrote it in order. Like I didn't write the whole present timeline and the whole past timeline. Like I, I, when I wrote it, I, I went back and forth in the writing. Um, so I was always, when I wrote whatever timeline, I was always aware of what I'd just written in the last chapter and what had just been revealed and this chapter going to build on that. Um, and one of the fun things about writing a dual timeline is that sometimes they contradict each other. Like there's a character uh, mm -hmm. named Marnie and Car Carly comes across her in the present and she says, I never met your aunt. I have no idea what you're talking about. And then you go straight into a chapter where the aunt Viv and Marnie are having, are driving around having a conversation. So, you know, the reader knows that Marnie is lying. So those are, you can play with a lot of those fun things where your character, you can have your character learn something. And then in the other timeline, you learn that, that, that that's just a total lie. And this character has no idea. Um, and so that's you only get that if you write the chapters in order instead of writing one whole timeline and then the other whole timeline. Um, when you're writing a story that has some supernatural elements um, like this book does, um, how do you balance um, things that are unexplainable or supernatural or, you know, out of this world while maintaining believability? Like what where where does the line come? where you you go from um supernatural fiction to just ludicrous you know like oh that can't mm. possibly happen how do you, how do you um you know keep people on the plane of believability while stretching and and taking us to places that we don't necessarily want to go well the all, i always say all of my supernatural sort of the parts of my stories they all are you know, arise from the question, what if, you know, and we've all, even skeptical people, we've all had moments at some point in our life where you're like, what is that sound? Like, what if, mm -hmm. what if that is some, what if this, that, that was a footstep? What if that's somebody in the next room? What if that's someone trying to open the door? You know, what if, what if that was, you know, and so that's kind of always where I place it is that, you know, what, what if there are still ghosts in this you know, in this motel, you know, what if that sound is not, that smell of cigarette smoke is not just in your mind? What if, you know, so that's kind of the line I always walk is, um, it just goes out right to the other side of what if, um, without going too far over that line. And a lot of it has to tie back to what's going on with the character. Um, what is that person afraid of? What is, you know, what is their mindset? Um, and how is this potentially supernatural thing happening? How is that affecting the mindset that that person already has? What, um, Simone, what do you think about um, you, when 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 you you've got a a novel planned out and you write it and and then it goes out to the world? Um, you know. Um, a, a novel a, a lot of times is either received really really well or or not so well and 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 there there are kind of few people in the middle and uh, novels like uh, you know suspense and and horror or supernatural thrillers that sort of thing tend to uh, be more polarizing where where people either mm -hmm. love it or they don't um mm -hmm. as a writer how do you handle um you know the the criticisms that come along with with writing things that can be so polarizing uh, with people, are, are there any things that you've learned along the way um, that help you deal with reader criticism? Um, yeah, it is very hard um, putting actually working on a book for you know as long as you do, and then putting it into the world is is terrifying. And it's funny because you know your first bu first book comes out, and your family's like, "Hey, you know, aren't you excited?" And you're like, "I want." to get in bed and put the covers over my head and never <laughs> come out of bed. Like that is the feel, at least for me, I'm not like, Hey, let's go party. I'm like, I'm going Throw to hide. In occasionally. My yeah. <laughs> hide in the corner and not look online and just, I can't do it. It's terrifying. It's terrifying. And, um, and yeah, you just get, you know, honestly, the, the thing about writing genre fiction or horror fiction, um, you just get used to that. Um, you just learn pretty early on that there are readers for what you're putting out and they love it and they are loyal and they are vocal and they will, you know, post on your 
social media and say, I, you are my favorite author. I love you. And like, you have those people and, um, they love what you're doing and whatever the, you know, New York times review of books thinks or doesn't think it, it doesn't really matter because you're reaching those people. And, right. um, and those people with, you know, social media is a double-edged sword because you can get a lot of criticism on social media, but also the people who love your work can reach you very, very easily and say, I love you. And this is the best book I've read all year. And those, those messages are what keeps you going where you're like, okay, you know, I am reaching my readers, the people who want this. And, and I have to, you just have to work on shutting everything else out because there is a lot of other noise and you just have to shut it out and focus on the readers who are loving what you do. Absolutely. That's great advice. Um, Simone, we know that uh, now that this book is out and available to everyone, um, you know, because of the way that publishing schedules work, this has probably been off your desk for quite a while while it goes through all the, the publishing machinations. And um, you're probably working on on something else now. What, what uh, can we expect in the near future? Um, I definitely am working on another one. Um, it's pretty much finished. I don't know when it's going to be out um, with publishing schedules have been completely derailed in 2020. And I don't, right. even, I don't even, you know what I haven't asked, but I don't even think my publisher knows when it's coming out. <laughs> I think they're just going <laughs> to, as they, they're taking things day by day, the way everybody else is, but um, it's definitely done. It's uh, uh, how, what can I say about it? Uh, there, it's about, um, an infamous, um, serial murder case in the 1970s, which is a case that I made up. It's not a real case. And the person who was accused of the murders and was acquitted in court is a woman. And in the present day, she decides to tell her story of what really happened in the 1970s in this murder case. And, uh, it is also a supernatural story. So um, that's about all I could say about it so far. We don't even have an official title yet, um, but I'm really excited about it. Uh, it would spin, uh, it's been really, really fun to work on for sure. I'll bet. Um, Simone, you mentioned something earlier and I meant to ask you about this. So I'm just going to ask you now. Um, you said that you're a, a fan of true crime. Um, do you ever listen to like a true crime podcast or watch a documentary or something and go, you know, if I were to write this as a novelist, no one would believe this. This is just crazy. Um, yeah, absolutely. What does, <laughs> what, what does being a fan of true crime uh, bring you as a writer? Do you, are there things that you learn or um, you, ideas that you get uh, or does it just feed you personally? Um, it does feed me personally. And I think um, I think being a true crime, you know, reading a lot of true crime. You do really get a lot of um, insight into human behavior and kind of extreme human behavior in some cases. But, you know, sometimes the more mundane human behavior, people who, you know, just in general, people who are lying or people who mess things up or people who make mistakes or people, you know, um, cops who do amazing work, and, you know, cops who miss really obvious things. And so you're, you're sort of, it's a lot of, um, it's a, for someone who's kind of an observer of human nature. Um, it's pretty fun, uh, to a pretty fun journey to take. Cause you see a lot of really crazy human behavior and you see a lot of, uh, really heroic and some really not heroic human behavior. And so it does, it feeds a lot of ideas for sure, uh, in the writing and in the creating plots and characters for sure. Well, the new book is called the sundown motel. There are links to it in the show notes of this episode where you can get it in Kindle edition or audiobook If you like to listen to books, uh, or you can get it in, uh, in hard copy. If you want to hold it in your hand, uh, e any way that you like to consume books, there's a link in the show notes to help you find it. Simone, uh, if people are just learning about you and want to dig into all the great stuff that you do, where can they find you online? Um, well, my website, simonestjames.com. And um, I'm also on Facebook. Uh, Facebook page is Simone St. James. And I'm on Instagram as well. Simone St. James on Instagram. And I, I go on those, both of those pretty regularly. Um, enjoy them. So, yeah, I'm, I'm definitely around online. 
Excellent. We'll put links to those uh, in the show notes as well to help people find you. Simone, this has been so much fun chatting. Uh, Thank you so much for taking time to come on the show. Thank you so much for having me. It's been so fun. Do you want to get paid to write stories? Do you enjoy collaborating with other talented storytellers? Do you want to work completely remotely and set your own hours? Relay Publishing is looking for writers and editors to work on fiction projects across a range of genres, from thrillers to sci-fi, fantasy, and romance. The Relay process is extremely collaborative, in the same vein as a TV show's writer's room. If you're a story geek, then you'll be on a great team. There are seven ghostwriting positions and ten editing positions currently available please go to www.recruitment.relaypub.com. That's www.recruitment.relaypub.com for more information on how to apply. Join a great storytelling team today. Invasion Day, the first book in the They Came for Blood series by Scott Moon. David Osage is a dangerous man with a complicated past, but these days he's just trying to keep his head down, driving big rigs. One night he saddles himself with a hitchhiker, a nuisance who's more than she seemed, and that's when everything changes. No one was ready for an alien invasion. Death is raining from the sky, and the only questions left is do you run, fight, or submit? For David Osage and his family, answering is as easy as giving the alien invaders the finger. Grab book one, Invasion Day, in the They Came for Blood series, and then follow it up with book two, Resistance Day, and book three, Victory Day. Available at Amazon.com. What Death Taught Terrence by Derek McFadden. Life is a journey. So is the afterlife. At the end of his life, Terrence McDonald must discover its meaning or he'll be banned from the afterlife forever and his soul will cease to exist. Join Terrence and those who love him on a poignant and unforgettable journey through a life at once wonderful and harrowing. Learn what Terrence learned. See what Terrence sees. By this provocative story's end, readers may even learn a thing or two about themselves. See why people are saying things like, Derek McFadden writes with an insight you can match. If you like the works of Mitch Album, I think you'll find What Death Taught Terrence a worthy addition to your library and the reading of it, a life-affirming journey. I found the story immediately immersive and it stuck with me long after I finished. What Death Taught Terrence by Derek McFadden on sale now 